Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Terrific. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Are you terrific this morning? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I don't think I have any special announcements. Pastor Jeremy, do I have any special announcements today? No, it's a pretty standard week this week. Um, does that, do any of you have any special announcements that you would like me to know about? Amish? <laughs> yeah, I went on a field trip with the Suburbanites to see a play in Amish country. There was lots of horses and buggies. And there was lots of old people on that trip. I don't know. <laughs> ah, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. <clears throat> okay, so. <laughs> oh, man. Different kind of old, Chuck. Different kind of old, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> um, all right, so I have a special, let's see. I need, all right, a comp- not competition, but like special giveaway thing. Hold on. I have more mugs. So, if you would like a mug, somebody share with me your favorite Bible verse. Huh? Wow, nobody has a... All right, come on, you guys. You're letting me down here. I'm working really hard. Huh? Huh? Oh, well, she has... We have one at home. She don't... Okay. Go ahead, Kevin. What's your favorite verse? 2 John 2.17. Awesome. Here, come get a mug, brother. Yeah, if you want to. Oh, Sam, you got... All right, hold on one second, Sam. I'll get to you in a sec. What is it, Sam? What does it say? Awesome. Give him a hand, you guys. Come on and get your mug. Amazing. I'm going to get rid of these mugs one way or another, I'm telling you. Okay. Um, no, we got some more mugs coming. You guys all have an opportunity. But I would say I, I kind of like this giving away a mug thing. So you might be, want to be prepared next week. Um, would you stand up this morning and would you greet your neighbor with a wonderful Christian greeting? How are we doing this morning, everyone? Doing good? I wanted to read um, just a short part of Psalm 95 before we get started in worship. And the psalmist says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is great. A great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. For the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. We sing and we praise God because he is great, he is mighty. I know I say that every week, but it's true. Like we can't even as meager, feeble humans grasp how wonderful and mighty and awesome God is. Amen? Let's pray before we enter into worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you. Uh, we praise you, Lord, this morning. Lord, we lift you up high. Lord, may we become low as we Just try to express ourselves in this way, Lord. Putting you first in our minds and our hearts this morning. Singing the praises, Lord, to you that you are deserving of. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we praise you. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church, what do you believe this morning? That's my question for you as we sing this song. I believe there is one salvation, one joy that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is destiny. Oh, praise you, God of 
What do we believe about the future? I believe in the hope of heaven He's preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Is the word and eyes have seen I believe that the day is coming He's returning to claim His bride Like the altar, deep and burning
about this morning. can be seated for just a moment as the ushers work their way forward. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we praise you this morning. We ask that you would be active and working in our hearts today. Lord, as we prepare to sing one more song of praise to you, Lord, and then to hear your word that our hearts would be soft, Lord, and receptive to your teaching today and to your presence, Lord, in this place this morning. Lord, we ask that you would be honored in our, our giving, Lord, as that too is an act of worship. So we just want to say, Lord, that we love you. Lord, we praise you. We give you all the glory in your name. We all pray. Amen. and generations are falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands above them all on all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name 
It stands above the law and the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. song forever to the end. If you walk in freedom, if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Oh, we'll sing the song forever and amen. And the angels cry. together as family. Lord, just spend this time with you today, lifting you up, hearing your word. Lord, we ask your blessing on the message now. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church family. As we uh, enter our time of prayer this morning, uh, I want to remind us of a weekly event that you can be a part of. And so you may not know this, and maybe you do, maybe you just forgot, uh, but I want to uh, just share that this uh, Wednesday at 8.30 a.m., you can join Anthony, myself, Glenn, some of the other people, are Maria and Wally have come to this, but at 8.30, so maybe we shared it as this was only happening during the summer. 
It is happening every week on Wednesday. And so I would love nothing more than all of you to quit your jobs and come at 8.30. No, uh, if you have Wednesday morning at 8.30 available, we would love to have you join us for prayer. Uh, we intentionally lift up each other, lift up our church, and lift up our community in, in that morning and take time to praise God as well. So um, 8.30 a.m. here on Wednesdays, that happens even during the school year. So that's not just a summer thing. So if you wanna join us for that, love for you to be able to join us. We also have an 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning prayer team that meets in room 201. And so maybe you say, I didn't realize there was a prayer group that meets at 8.30 a.m. Now you know. So next week, all of you be here at 8.30 and we have to move in here. That would be a great problem to have. That's not a problem, actually. We could easily do that. I'll just have to tell Chewy to start worship practice at like seven, <laughs> which I, yeah, he's all for, right? No. <laughs> but as we turn to our time of prayer this morning, we specifically want to be lifting up our missionary, uh, Lorella Rouster. She is the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Every Child Ministry and has been writing Bible lessons for those in the country of Congo. Uh, she has specifically been asking for prayer for her move to Tennessee. In case you didn't know, uh, John passed away recently, her husband. And so we want to be lifting up Lorella specifically uh, this morning. And she's asking for help uh, as she's moving to Tennessee, pray specifically for her mental, emotional, and physical strength, uh, especially since the passing of her husband, John. And as she's getting her house ready to list and then searching uh, for a new house, uh, near one of her daughters in Tennessee. So we could be praying for that this morning. Now, so if you hear things that happen uh, on <laughs> in the service this morning, uh, that's probably my computer that we're using. So here's another uh, thing that I need to present to you all. Our, our computer uh, pretty much took a dump this week, if I could put it plainly. Uh, it just died. And so uh, the, the nice computer we had, it was getting older anyway, so we need to replace that. And so we are using uh, my computer this morning. So if there's technical glitches or you hear something like that, blame me. Don't look to them. Just blame me. It's my computer that they're using right now. They're using my laptop temporarily. Uh, but that just to put that out there, that's about a somewhere between $2,000 and $4,000. Uh, if you want to help us get a new computer, you are more than welcome to do that. We also, again, uh, we would love to be able to do that. You walk up to me today and hand me a check for $5,000. I'm going to go, sweet, we're ordering the best Mac we can get. We won't have this problem again. Last us another 15 years. That would be amazing. Uh, but that literally happened on Friday. So uh, I just want to recognize Pastor Chewy and praise God for Pastor Chewy being here on Friday and just the work he was doing to get this ready. So yeah, he just walked back in. So praise God for Chewy. Uh, Pastor Chewy has been doing a lot of work this weekend uh, where it's just behind the scenes stuff that maybe you don't know happens during the week. You may be going, your idea of what pastors do during the week is just we're sitting up in the office praying for you all, all week, which we are, all right? So we are doing that, but there are other technical things that happen and come up. This is just one of those weeks. So uh, again, I wanna state clearly, if you hear any weird noises, just it's my fault, okay? But uh, let's lift up Lorella. And then again, I wanna lift up specifically just our country once more. And so we'll continue to do this regularly. Um, I, I will say this as gently as I can. I don't know that we're gonna have any winner come January when we have a new president. And so I, I mean that from the standpoint of some of us are so dedicated to people that we miss out on being dedicated to Christ. And so I, I want what's best for our country. I, I, I mean this wholeheartedly. I'm not trying to say don't care about politics. Otherwise, if I didn't care, I wouldn't say, hey, let's be praying intentionally. But my prayer for our country is that they turn to Christ. That is, that is my heart for our country. And so we're gonna continue to lift up all the candidates, those that are participating in this. But above all, I want them to come to Christ. So please hear me as I say that even this morning. We're gonna lift up um, both the candidates once again this morning. So if you would, join me in prayer and we'll lift up Lorella as well. Lord, we come before you this morning, just the people that are needy, that we need you above all. And so we just come before you admitting that we don't have it all together. We don't always know the way that your plans are gonna provide for us and the way that this world may go. But what we do know is that you are coming again. And so I pray that this morning we would fix our eyes on you once more. Lord, I pray that we would have a heart that's praying for our country because it needs it. So I lift up the candidates this morning to you. I lift up Kamala Harris to you. I lift up Donald Trump to you this morning. 
Lord, I pray that in each of their lives, they would soften their heart to you if they have not already, and that they would come to a saving knowledge of you. I pray also for the vice presidents that are running as well. We lift them up to you today. Pray for their hearts as well. Lord, I pray for our country right now. It just seems like there's no possible way for us to be unified in this situation. But I trust you. My hope is in you. And I turn to you this morning and ask for your wisdom and discernment and how to care for one another, even through this election. Lord, I come before you also lifting up Lorella Roster to you today. I pray for her, especially with her emotional, mental, and physical health as she's moving and no longer has John to help her. And so we lift up the move to Tennessee just that you would be glorified, even as she's still working and writing Bible studies and studying your word. I pray that you'd be glorified in her, her life. So thank you again for Lorella this morning. And we pray that the move is smooth. She's able to sell her house quickly and then find the house that is just perfect for her in Tennessee. Lord, may you be glorified above all in our, in our worship this morning. So give, be with us now as we turn to your word and we just ask for your help and discernment and being more like you that we might impact our community for eternity. We pray all these things in your name, amen. Well, today's passage comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15 through 18. And we're gonna hear truth once more. We're gonna hear these two promises that we ended with last time. And then we're gonna ask the question, how should we respond? And so I've said this before, today will be a unique service. And you're gonna hear that again because the fifth Sunday is gonna be a super unique service as well. I don't say that to scare you away. Come, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be great uh, because we're gonna be talking about our Lord and Savior. And that's, that's what makes it amazing, not just these ideas that I have. But when we hear this truth, when we hear these promises, we should respond. We should respond accordingly and necessarily to what God's word says. So I'd ask that question even this morning. How has your life been different this past week as you've heard the word of God, as you've been in the word? Have you become more like Christ and less like the world? Because that's my prayer for us this morning, even as we hear the word. So I'm gonna invite you to stand as we read Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. And we'll once again hear the two promises from last week. And that'll lead us into our study this morning of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 says this, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there's forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. So we are winding down our focus on Jesus being our high priest. And this week, we'll start to move towards a focus on how the hearer of this message should respond. I try every week to give us applications. How does this impact us today? And today will be no different other than we're gonna put some of that into practice today. And so when I say we're having a unique service, it's because so often we've turned worship service into come hear this guy speak for 40 minutes and we pray he's done before noon so that we can make it home for football and lunch. That's what we've turned it into sometimes. Worship service is so much more than that. Worship service is so much more. We shouldn't worry about what's coming up next. We should worry about whose presence we're in today. That's really key. That's vital that we know, that we recognize that we are in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's with us right now. And so as we're winding down this thought on Jesus being our high priest, the author moves us to this thought that there are two absolute truths that we should hear and never forget. It's kind of like the summary of what he's already been saying. And then he gives us three necessary responses these are necessary responses. It's not just like, hey, if you feel like doing it, great for you. No, it's you respond accordingly. These responses are not just suggestions. As we start, I want to be clear that this is crucial in our study of the Word of God. Whenever we study the Word or hear the Word of God, we should constantly be thinking about how this will change the way I live. How is this going to change the way I live today? If I've been in the Word of God, if it truly is the Word of God, is it impacting me? Is it changing me to be more like Christ? These responses often, we, we come up with individual, individualistic responses. Sorry, my tongue's tied this morning. 
but we come up with an individual response. These three responses are corporate. So guess what? We're gonna put them corporately into practice. And you may be going, I did not sign up for this this morning. I'm just here as a visitor. Friends, I love you all. But we get to respond accordingly to the word this morning, and it's gonna be great. So when we get there, I pray that you participate. You can sit there and go, hmm, I'm not gonna respond. I'm not doing it. That's fine. If you don't wanna participate, don't part- I can't make you participate because I can't change your heart either. Only the word of God can do that. Only the Lord can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So as we start, how's your heart doing? I pray that it's soft to the word of God this morning. Today, I'll be asking us to think through what this looks like in our church specifically, and even ask us to discuss these thoughts with one another. Let us hear the truth and then respond properly. So here's the outline for us this morning. We're gonna hear two absolute truths and the big ideas that come from them. And then we will move into the three necessary responses. So verses 19 through 21 gives us the two absolute truths. And then verses 22 through 25 gives us the three necessary responses. The first absolute truth for us this morning comes from verses 19 and 20 of Hebrews chapter 10. And it's this, Jesus died as our sacrifice. Look at verses 19 and 20 with me. Verses 19 and 20 of Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. The first truth, Jesus died for us. Hallelujah, right? We know that. You're like, we've heard that already. We've heard that a lot this year as we studied the gospel of Mark, sacrificial servant. Pastor Jeremy, you've talked about that over and over again. I have, intentionally, because that is the foundation for which we stand. Christ died for a sinner like me. We now have confidence to enter the heavenly temple because of the blood of Jesus. It's better than the blood of animals. It's superior to the blood of animals. And his blood allows us to come with confidence that we no longer will face death, punishment, and consequences for our sin eternally. Now, we may have consequences earthly for our sin. That could happen. But we no longer have an eternal consequence. Our debt's been paid in full. His body was broken that we might have a new and living way to come before God the Father. The curtain that separated the holy and most holy place has been torn. There's no longer separation because of this sacrifice. Jesus uses the same imagery when he talks about being the door for the sheep to go through. John 10 is where we find this teaching. John 10, 7 through 10 says this. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We have access through Jesus. Are you experiencing the abundant life that Jesus gives us? Abundant life. One, one of my favorite speakers, I'm not gonna say his name right now, but says when we understand who Jesus is and we understand the life eternal that comes by him, the abundant life doesn't just mean that we're on this roller coaster of high and low. It actually means we're on the highest of highs when we understand the salvation of Christ and then we understand the lowest of lows because we understand the agony of sin even more so. So you may be going through life as, uh, before you were saved, life is like this. You understand, hey, circumstances are hard. Life is hard. Life is difficult. So you're on this roller coaster, up and down, up and down. And then when you come to Christ, you're like, oh, his salvation is greater, but man, my sin is horrible. That's the highs and lows. That's the life abundant that we experience when we come to Christ. But because of that, we now have access to God the Father. And verse 20 speaks on the second truth as well, because Jesus is not dead. We do not serve a dead savior. Our God lives. Have you been waiting for this? You're like, we didn't do this for a couple weeks, right? You know what I'm about to say, right? Some of you are like, just get it over with, all right? Like, no, we should never tire of this. He is risen. Good 
job, right? Like I prepared you for it, right? You were there. Our Savior lives though. We should never tire of hearing that truth. We should never get old. Like that should never just become something that we say because our great high priest lives and is interceding for us today. Jesus lives as our great high priest. Look at verse 21 of Hebrews 10. It says this, Jesus lives as our great high priest and since we have a great high priest, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus lives, he is risen, and he's seeing over the house of God. Now, we talked about this last week. He is seated at the right hand, and the ministry of the perfect sacrifice is finished. But you better believe that Jesus is still at work. The harvest is still plentiful for us today. There is still work to be done. And so even as we say, hey, come and sit down, hear the message, that's what I mean by our work as a body is not done. Our work as a church body is not done. Jesus has not returned yet. And so we're gonna get to participate in the worship service. Well, we've already done that a little bit this morning. We sing praises to his name. The question I would ask is, are we singing praises to his name in our heart or are we just doing it out of routine? And I, only you can answer that, God could answer that. But I can't, I wish I had like these lenses where I could look out and see right into your heart and see in your mind and see how you are doing. And then I could be like, I could call you out and go, I don't feel bad for calling you out because I see that your heart is hard this morning. <laughs> Soften it, soften it, whatever it takes. Break through the hardness of your heart and hear the word of the Lord this morning because he's interceding for us as well. Jesus is risen and is seated right next to the heavenly father. And when we compare that to the priest working to make sacrifices, we should realize that the sacrifice, it is finished. Romans 8, 34, again, if you weren't here last week and you missed that truth, here it is once more. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. His work is not complete, but his sacrifice is. Hallelujah. The author of Hebrews has clearly stated the two absolute truths at this point. And you may be looking at your watch and be going, whoo, we're making good time. We're through the two absolute truths already. This is gonna be a quick service. I'm gonna be home. Like, no, like, please, again, put those thoughts out of your head. All right, surrender your time to the Lord. Not, not just to me this morning, all right? But as we think through that, the author has given us these thoughts. First, Jesus died as our perfect sacrifice and, he, and in doing so provided life for us. And then the second truth is Jesus lives as our great high priest. He didn't just die once and then stay dead. He rose again and he lives. Jesus is superior. He is the best. And then we should naturally be hearing these verses and be thinking of ways that we should respond. The author uses words like therefore and since. And when we hear anyone say since, we should immediately be looking for the then statement. Since this has happened, then you should respond accordingly. That's a great thought to have as you're reading God's word. If it says therefore, you should probably go see what it was there for, right? We understand that thought. When it says since, we should be going, ooh, there's a response coming. He's gonna say, then you should do this. And we should have that always before us. And you may be tempted to think that this is how I should respond individually, which I already shared with you. But the author of Hebrews says, no, this is a group project and it requires a corporate response. And some of you go, ooh, I don't like group projects, right? Like I do not like group projects. I will tell you this, when I was in school, when the teacher assigned group project, all I heard was more work for me. Like that's all I heard. That's just more work for me to do. Friends, as a church body, we should be carrying each other's burdens. Who cares if it's more work for us? Because the reality is, Jesus paid it for us. So we should be actively at work for one another as well. And we shouldn't see it as a burden. We should see it as an opportunity to lift each other up and to encourage one another. We will do it. That should be the mindset that we have after we hear these thoughts. So think of Israel when they responded, we'll do it. And then you go, oh, they're not gonna do it. We know the story of Israel, they failed, right? They messed up. We're gonna respond differently though. We're gonna say, Lord, change our hearts and then change our minds 
and then impact the way we live and let us live differently. As we go through these three responses, I encourage you to take note of the thought of this. It says, let us. Let us respond accordingly. And it doesn't just say, hey, if you want to, if you will. It says, no, you will. We will respond this way. And so we're gonna put this into practice. And there's three lasting virtues that you may have heard of. 1 Corinthians 13, we'll get into it here in a little bit. But it says, three, these three virtues remain, faith, hope, and love. The responses are tied intimately to those three virtues, faith, hope, and love. We respond in faith, we respond in hope, and we respond in love. The first necessary response the author calls us to is to draw near in faith. Since Jesus died for us, since he rose again and is interceding for us, we need to respond in faith. Look at Hebrews verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 22. It says this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Draw near with a true heart, with a sincere heart. Whenever I hear that language, I often, we are entering a Halloween season and it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown is coming up. I can't wait for it. But there's one little boy that says, I have the most hope and the great pumpkin is gonna arrive. Anyone know who that is? No? Linus, all right? He's like, I have the most sincere heart, the most truest heart. Now, his faith was in the wrong place, all right? Let me just make that clear, all right? Uh, high schoolers and middle schoolers, if you're here going, oh no, the great pumpkin's not real, sorry, all right? Like, if you just figured that out, I apologize. But um, what we do have, where is our faith? Where is our hope? Because first, we draw near in full assurance. Full assurance is like confidence to the max, it's the most certain confidence we can have. We can do this again because of what Jesus' sacrifice has done for us. It's cleansed us of an evil conscience. We are washed and cleansed and now acceptable to God the Father. And this again is seen in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians six eleven. And such were some of you. Some of you were the worst of sinners. Pretty much all of us were, if we admit that. And all of us were sinners at one time and we probably still are today. But when it talks about 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about some of you were like the worst of worst. And he comes to this thought, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. If you've given your life to Christ, your identity is no longer found in your sin and in your death. It's found in your resurrection and your life of Christ. Your identity is wrapped up in him. You cannot separate those two. You can't just go, oh, Monday through Friday and Monday through Saturday, I'm gonna live in this, this box over here, in this worldly box, and I'm gonna be fine with it. No, our identity is so wrapped up in Christ that we are a Monday through Sunday, 24-7, 365 days a year, Christian living for Christ all the time. There's no off time when we're living on mission for Christ. We don't get that. So draw near confidently in faith because we have been made whiter than snow. We are no longer stained by sin, but we're cleansed. Faith is defined really well in chapter 11. And I can't wait for us to get there. And I didn't put it on the screen, but verse one of chapter 11, faith is defined by the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction or confidence of things not seen. Faith in Christ. Faith in what he has done for us should give us confidence. So how are we doing as a church body of being confident in our faith? What does it look, for, look like for us as a church body to respond to this? What does it look like as a church body for us to draw near in faith? Drawing near to God in faith should be such that as a church body, we come before him, making bold requests of him that are not concerned with the circumstances of this life, but are concerned with the eternal kingdom and who will be there. Coming before him and drawing near in faith and saying, Lord, I wanna be about your business and about sharing your, your salvation with anyone and everyone around me. When's the last time we said, Lord, I wanna pray specifically for that house right back here on the street? 
When's the last time we said, I wanna pray for the two streets that encompass us and the front street here in front of us? When's the last time we said, we wanna pray that our neighbors, even though they may go to another church, that they know that we love them? When's the last time that's happened? Some of you may say, I do that regularly. Some of you may say, well, I put out a sign in my front lawn, which is great. Please put out the, front, the sign in your lawn. That is awesome. Thank you again, Jacob, and those that worked, Pastor Chewy, that worked hard on those. They look great. But then use that as an opportunity to have a conversation with your neighbor. If we just put out the sign and say, look how great we are, that's not drawing near in faith. That's not as much as we wanted to. Drawing near to God in faith should be such that as a church body, we come before him and we say, Lord, what might you have for us? So here's a, here's a little example we're gonna, I'm gonna walk us through. I intentionally did not put it on the screen, but if you have your Bibles and you wanna turn to Matthew chapter six, verses nine through 13, the Lord gives us a great example of what it looks like to draw near to him in faith. Jesus teaches the disciples how they should pray. The problem with this is we've turned this into a routine of just quoting a verse and we, we, some of us know it by heart, but we forget to take it into practice and just say, hey, it's not just repeating these words. It's actually saying we're gonna put this into practice. So here's what it says. Pray then like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pause right there. His name is holy. Praise him for who he is. Group participation time. Who is God? Who is he? Creator, Savior, Father, Hope, Life, Sustainer, right? Everything, anything, and I had said this, last, we did this already, maybe you forgot, but you're doing much better of it this morning than you did last time we did it, all right? So God's doing something, all right? God's working in your hearts, that's a good thing. But each of you should be able to look at your neighbor, look at the person in front of you, behind you, to the side of you, and you should be able to go, I wanna tell you who my God is. Not because of who I think he is, but because of what God says. That's super different than, it's not just what I think, it's what does the Bible tell us. Look at this right now. He's our father, he's in heaven, and he's holy. We should praise him for that. Take one minute, just look at the person next to you and say, God is holy. Now, take one attribute of God that you, that again, you've seen in scripture and share it with that same person. Go, quickly, do it. Behind you, before you, around you. If you need to get up and move, go for it. If you're like, again, I don't wanna participate, that's okay. I can tell you this, I'd encourage you to move though because we're gonna have a lot of group participation going on, all right? So, he is holy, he is awesome, he is righteous, he's our savior. I can literally take every single work, book of the Bible and we should be able to go, I see God at work in this, this scripture because Genesis, he's our creator. Exodus, he's the savior. He's the provider, he's the protection. He's their abundant joy. He's their life. He is the covenant-keeping God of Israel. He is still the covenant-keeping God today. Like we should just go on and on and on and on and on where you go, let's move on because we've done, we've exhausted it. The problem is we can't exhaust describing who God is. So we praise him. That's drawing near in faith. It's, it's saying out loud who God is. I'm gonna declare who he is because he's worthy of it. Second part of this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not give me what I want, not my kingdom come, not enhance my bank account. This is not a health and wealth gospel. This is a Lord, let your kingdom, let your great name, let your will be done. Lord, give us a heart for your kingdom and your concerns. Let, us, let our focus be on you and not ourselves. So then we praise him for what he's done in our life. What has God done in your life recently that you could say, I just wanna praise him for this? We praised him for who he is. What has he done though? What has he done in your life? Take that same moment. Again, hopefully you're in a group right there with you. Share with someone, what has God done in your life? that you could praise him for right now. 
Go. If you're watching online, again, as it's taught, people are talking here, I'd encourage you, type online, type in the Facebook chat, share with us, what has God been doing in your life? Maybe you're watching on YouTube later. You can still type on there as well. We'd be glad to, to read those as well. All right. So if you didn't get a chance to share, think through that. Share it afterwards. Talk about it as you're having a cookie and coffee. All right? Because the next part is this. Give us this day our daily bread. We've just said, I'm praising you for who you are. I'm praising you for what you've done. And now I come before you and I ask. What am I asking? I'm asking you to meet my needs. Give us our daily bread. Those are needs, not wants. Please hear that specifically. Lord, meet our needs. We, pray, we beg you, we praise you that you have met our needs. And so we see how you provided. You're our provider. He's met our needs. But Lord, we never cease saying, Lord, give us our daily bread. Lord, meet our needs. And then help us recognize that you're the provider of those needs. We're not gonna take time to do that right now, but you should recognize what are those needs in your life that you have. Now, I said it's not our wants. It's not a Mustang convertible showing up in my, <laughs> like, in my driveway. I've shared that before. Just because we want that doesn't mean that's what we need. <laughs> amen, thank you, Leanne, all right. <laughs> of all the things, say amen, that's the thing you, amen. <laughs> but then it should turn us, Lord, provide our needs, and then, it says this, forgive us our debts. So Lord, meet our needs and then help us because we need you. We need your forgiveness. We need your salvation. Forgive us of our sin. We talked about this in a youth group this morning. When we talked about the greatness of God's forgiveness, we shouldn't use forgiveness as a safety net to go on sinning. Sinning is, is going to happen. And when we do, we, we confess it. But we don't use it as, oh, I can sin because there's a safety net there of forgiveness. No, we use it when, as needed. But the goal is to not use the safety net. That is the goal. So Lord, forgive us when we do sin, but then also help us as we also forgive our debtors. So forgiveness, it's a need, and then we need to express it to one another. I'm gonna ask us just to do something that will be, some of you may go, ooh, this is awkward, and that's okay. I'm gonna ask us to just sit in silence and examine our hearts. We do this during communion, but we can do it in other stages of the worship service as well. So here's what I'm gonna ask. Examine your life. Maybe there's time in your life, even today, where you go, hmm, I messed up. I need to seek God's forgiveness. I need to intercede. I need someone to intercede for me. Friends, go before the Lord and ask for our forgiveness. So just 30 seconds here. It's not gonna be very long. It'll feel like eternity, but I'd ask you just intercede right now for your own heart. Seek God's forgiveness as necessary. And then I'll pray for us here. Lord, we just come before you admitting that we are sinners and that we are in need of your forgiveness. I praise you that you do forgive us when we do sin. Lord, I pray that we would also bear with one another and forgive one another when they sin against us as well. Because while we were sinners, Christ, you died for us. While you were, we were enemies, you died for us. We praise you again for your forgiveness this morning. May we bear with one another well. We pray these things in your name. Amen. He closes those verses by saying this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, by your strength, by your power, allow us to overcome temptation and the sin that so easily entangles us, the world that is so desiring our heart, allow us to resist that and follow you wholeheartedly.
today. That's my prayer for our church body. That's my prayer for for myself. But as a church body, may we be a city on a hill, shining bright your, your name and your glory, Lord. May we represent you well. So let us draw near in faith this morning, corporately. Do you feel like you've drawn near to the Lord this morning? <laughs> because some of you may be going, no, <laughs> I don't. Feelings can be deceptive. And so that's why we have to recount truths of God's word. So when we draw near to the Lord, we draw near in his word. Draw near to him this morning, friends. Let us cry out. Let us put this into practice. May we boldly approach his throne again and again and make requests of him that are in line with his will and not our wants. I pray that actually our wants and his will line up. That's my prayer for us as a church body. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The second necessary response for us is to hold fast and to hope. Verse 23, since then you've heard these two promises, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast to our confession. What are we confessing? We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. We cling to those truths. We recount them over and over again. Jesus is coming and our hope is not in this life, but in the reality that he is coming soon. So our response should be that we are on mission for him. First Peter 1, 6 through 9 says it this way. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We rejoice. This life is hard. The promise is not trust God and life gets easier. We are grieved by various trials. Life is not always easy, but as our faith is tested, I pray that it would result in a faith that is genuine. See, the Christian life is more than just praying a prayer and then going, ooh, I'm saved, I have fire insurance. The Christian life is a relationship with our Savior who has gone through the fires of this world before us and is there with us through the fires that we are experiencing. And the result should be this. We praise him in the storms and the circumstances of this life because this life is not the end. Worldly treasures are not the prize that we seek. Our hope is rooted and founded in Jesus coming again, the heavenly eternal prize of being in the presence of our Lord and Savior. So we go through the trials of this life clinging to Jesus. He is interceding for us today. He's interceding on our behalf and we cling to those promises that we've had, that we just went through. We go through the struggles that God may be glorified and not us because it's all about him anyway. So let's put this into practice right now. Let's intercede for each other right now. And the goal of this is that we hold fast our confession in Jesus without wavering because God is faithful. So here's what I'm gonna ask. We used to do this at the end of service. We would say, if you have a silent or an unspoken request, and maybe you've even declared that request and you want prayer, you need us to intercede for you as a church body. We asked, we used to do this. We would say, stand right where you're at. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do that right here in the middle of service. Maybe you go, man, I'm going through a circumstance. I'm going through a trial. I, I don't want to share it with anyone, but I need someone to lift me up today. I need someone praying on my behalf. If you would like that this morning, I would invite you, just stand where you're at and we'll pray for you. Not by name. I'm not going to ask you to share it out loud. Just ask you to stand and we'll pray for you here. Any others? All right. So here's what I'd like you to do. 
Just notice who's standing. That's not to embarrass them. This is really to say, Lord, we wanna intercede on your behalf. And so see who's standing around you. And here's what I would also ask. If you're able and you're willing and people don't mind, just draw near to them. You don't have to touch them. You don't have to put your hands on them. Just draw near to them if you would. And then uh, I'm gonna pray for you, for you, those of you that are standing. And then I'd invite you that are seated, intercede as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we love you. And we're so thankful again that you hear us. I lift up these brothers and sisters that are standing before me today. I pray for those that may be online watching now or later that need interceding even this morning. Lord, we know that you hear us and we know that you are alive and active and you respond. I pray that you would answer the prayer and these requests and meet these needs where they're at. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't be in the way that we desire, but it would be your will, not ours. Lord, I pray for our hearts this morning. May we bear with one another, even through the trials and the circumstances of this life. And may we do it in such a way that is loving and compassionate and bold. So we come before you, Lord, admitting that we are not perfect and that we're in need. And I lift up the requests that are before me this morning. May you receive all the glory, honor, and praise for the way that you answer these requests. We pray these all in your name, amen. Thank you for standing there and for joining us in that. So I know there's probably more of you that maybe go, man, I need prayer, but I'm not gonna stand. I'm not gonna admit it. My prayer is that all of us would recognize, we could probably go, hey, all of us need prayer, right? And maybe you go, well, my circumstance isn't as bad as someone else's. The responsibility of the church is to come alongside and we bear all each other's burdens, no matter how great or no matter how small. So no matter what the request is, if you have requests, please put them in the box. There's cards on the back of your chair. I don't say this lightly. We would love to pray for you. And we do that weekly. We could even start adding that to what we do at 8.30 on, on Wednesdays. We, we do it Sunday morning here. We do it in our staff meetings. Church body, you are prayed for. But if there are ways that we could do that specifically, we would love to do that. At this point, we have seen the need to draw near to God in faith. We've now seen our response should be to hold fast our confession and hope. Again, and it's more, hope is so much more than just that hope of, of wishing hope. It's confident hope because we know where our hope is in. It's in Christ who is coming again. And we look forward to that. Our third response then should be this. We consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Some of you may be hearing this and you go, ooh, we get to stir each other up. Yeah, like it's gonna be great, all right? So it's gonna be good stirring though. Not bad stirring, not the kind of stirring where I was with my brothers and I would stir them up to trouble. No, this is stirring up in love and good works, all right? We stir them up that way. Not to try and get each other in trouble, but to get each other to be more like Christ. Look at verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. Our time is running short. Life is not eternal in this world. So one of two things will happen. Either we will pass away or Christ will come. Either way, we need to respond accordingly. We need to be on mission. What does this look like for us as a church body today then? You may be thinking to yourself, aren't we doing this right now? Isn't that what the preaching of the word is? Hey, Pastor Jeremy, you're doing a great job of stirring us up to love and good works. No, that's not, it's not just me. It's all of us participating in this. All of us should be stirring one another up to love and good works to love and to good works. As we meet together, it shouldn't just be come, hear the word, and then leave and check it off your list of things that you've done. But hopefully, you're encouraged as you walk in the door. 
I don't know who was greeting this morning, but I'm sure you did a great job. I, I pray you did. Now, if you snuck in here today and you weren't greeted and you weren't welcomed, I'm sorry. It's my fault. All right. Uh, we want to greet you. So you, that's why we often say you're greeted. We are glad to have you here. And we also greet you though. And uh, so my dad just reminded me that their church does this often. It's a great way to greet one another. We greet you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because it's not about us. We want you to know him. but it's more than that. Hopefully it happens as you come and you sing praises to the Lord. And maybe you say, well, I didn't sing out loud, but I pray that you're singing in your heart. I pray that your heart is on fire for the Lord. You can't help but sing out loud, no matter what it sounds like. I pray that you're encouraged through the teaching and preaching of the word. And then it encourages us to live differently because we've heard the word. And as we go out, we go, I can't help but tell my neighbor about what I've just heard. I need to tell you about my savior. I need to tell you about my creator. I need to tell you about the one who saved my life. Paul calls the church out for not loving properly, by the way. In the letter to the Corinthians, he lovingly corrects them. Sometimes we hear 1 Corinthians 13 as a call at weddings. So I'll admit, our wedding included 1 Corinthians 13, but it is actually a rebuke. Hey, get it together, love better, do it properly. And so this morning, I wanna give us that same call. Now, please hear this. I am not sharing this going, hey, Mission Bible Church, you need to love better. I actually think we're doing a pretty good job of it, but we could always do better. That's the point. So hear it this, from this lens. Don't think of this as a wedding chapter which again, I don't mind when we read it at weddings. That's not, not a bad thing, all right? But look at verses one through three because this should be how we stir up one another in love. And the first way we stir up to love is to love should be enriching. Love should be enriching. Verses one through three of 1 Corinthians 13 says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and, I have, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is not about look at what I did. Love is not about saying look how awesome my faith is. Love is all about how awesome Christ is. Ministry without love is just busyness. And we can become really busy. We're really good at putting on programs and activities and we can be really busy. But if we're doing it without love, if we're doing it for ourselves, we are doing it wrong. Using my gift without the body and mind is selfishness. It's not love at all. Love is not about what do I get out of this, but how can I sacrificially serve as Christ served us? This is why when we speak the truth, we do it in love. It is for the enrichment of one another. It doesn't mean the truth won't hurt. Truth will hurt at times, but we better think about how we say it. We better think about how we speak to one another. We must be aware of how we are speaking to one another and then how are we using our gifts for the body. The second part of this, love is edifying. Verses four through seven says this, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, love is not about looking at one another's gift and then going, man, I wish I had that gift. Man, if only I had that gift, I would be able to be on fire for Christ today. No, God has given you a gift. Use that gift for his glory, not yours. Praise God for the gift that he has given to one another. 
and that he's given to us. We build one another up. We don't rejoice when someone makes a mistake and then we think we get to come in and save the day. We're not looking for me to mess up and then one of the elders go, ooh, I get to preach next Sunday because Pastor Jeremy just blew it. Like that shouldn't be, now if I do, I pray that they would do that actually. Like if I messed up, I pray that they would actually say, hey, you need to take a week off and think about what you just said there. But the reality is, we don't do that as an opportunity to rejoice at someone's downfall. We say, let me come alongside and bear and pick you up when you've fallen. So we bear with one another and endure through the struggles. Build up, don't tear down. Third, love is enduring. Verses eight through 13, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Friends, we need to love one another properly. The book of Hebrews should be causing us to mature in our faith. If we are going to love one another properly, it will not be boastful, it will not be arrogant, but we will realize the gifts and talents God has given to us, and then we will use them for the benefit of the church body. See, the world is temporary. The things of this world will fade but our faith is not in this world. Our hope is not in this world. Our love is not for this world. Our faith, hope, and love are in Christ. We then stir one another up to love and good works because Christ first loved us and gave himself up for us. So let's pray about how we might stir one another up to love and good works. The coat closet great way to stir one another up to love and good works. Awana, great way to stir one another up to love and good works. Summit Youth Group on Sunday nights, great way to love and stir one another up to good works. Sunday School, ABF, right? I could keep going down the list. And if there's a ministry that I miss, I'm going to miss one because I'm going to stop right there. So I'm sure there's other ministries that I could easily, small groups, (laughs) right? Join a small group and then feel the love and edifying hopefully, of your small group. Um, Sarcasm is not a gift, by the way. Please hear that. That is not a gift that God gives us. So we put that away because that's what maturity should be causing us to do. Puns are not a gift. They are a curse, all right? They're hereditary. They're passed down from sinful generation to sinful (laughs) generation. Oh, sorry, dad, right here. (laughs) May we live, though, a life of worship and respond properly. So as we draw near in faith and as we hold fast in hope, may we stir one another up to love and good works because the day is drawing near. So I want you to have these three responses in our mind as a church body. Respond this way, draw near in faith, hold fast in hope, and then stir up in love. Stir up to those good works. Say, hey, go out and do something awesome for the Lord. Enter that mission field alert, looking for who needs to hear. Be on fire for him. One of the best ways I can think for us to respond this morning is with the thought that Jesus is returning soon. And our response should be that we corporately praise him. So you may be going, ooh, we're gonna read Hebrews 12 too. Ha ha, gotcha, we're not. All right, we're not gonna sing, or sing Hebrews 12 too. What we are gonna do is we're about to sing the doxology. And so maybe you don't know what the doxology is, um, but we're gonna sing it a cappella here because I think it's a fitting response for us as a church body. And it says this, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host." Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then it ends with the amen. And here's the thought. Because we're still gonna close with the closing song and I, I look forward to that. It's gonna be awesome, right? We're gonna, we're gonna glorify God in our singing. But as we've heard the word today, our response should be nothing but praise. I wanna praise you, God, because you're awesome. So if you would, stand with me. 
We're gonna sing this out a cappella. And some of you may not know the tune. That's okay. Do your best to follow along, listen, and then participate if you can. But here's what it says. Sing it out with me if you know it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we love you. We say it with our mouth. I pray that we would say it with our heart, with our life, that we would live lives committed to you this morning. So we come before you once again, admitting that we are not perfect. We don't have it all together, but Lord, I pray that we would submit our lives to the one who does, the one who is perfect, the one that knows all things, that holds all things, and is coming again and coming soon. May we set our hearts on you this morning, Lord. May we live our lives in such a way that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise, and that if anything, we would be pointing one another to you, Lord. Lord, I pray once more for those in this church body, those that are hearing this message that may be hurting, that may be suffering, Lord, answer their cry today. Answer our cry. And we come before you just saying we need you. Lord, we praise you again for this morning. Now may we sing with all our hearts to your great name. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our great high priest, our savior, the supreme and awesome savior that you are the name of Jesus. Amen. Come let us worship our King. And come let us bow at His feet. He has a great See what our Savior
send you off with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance toward you and give you peace. Amen. We love you, church family. Have a great afternoon.